It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, Todd was so boring and not much energy, so I, I think I can do better than that. Um, no, it, it's sharing the stage with these two gentlemen today on a topic that I love more, uh, couldn't love more, um, is an incredible honor. Um, I'm going to continue a lot of the themes that Todd just talked about, and I want to start out, and I'm just, I start every presentation. Here's Monique, who used to work in our group, now works here, and had done the ethnographic field work that informed that video that you showed this morning. These are all real people from studies that we have done at Intel over the last 12 years. And, and as Paul just said, we have done this work focusing on aging and recruiting over a thousand elderly homes and households in 20 different countries. When we recruit these people, they may be 40 people who have had problems with the fall. And we will then go and study them at hospital discharge and then and study their entire care experience. So we then go study the clinicians, the family caregivers. We live and immerse ourselves in that community that they're immersed in. So while we recruit them at the hospital or we recruit them because they have diabetes or we recruit them because they're dealing with Parkinson's, we end up studying their entire, studying their entire care experience. Intel hates these studies, they're hard to budget because we kind of go where the care goes. So you don't really know once you recruit, recruit those thousand households, how many other thousands of households and facilities you're gonna have to go to if you wanna truly understand health and wellness. I am personally motivated to do this. Um, these are pictures of my grandparents. This is my grandfather, Jack. Uh, this is me with that lovely Bill Cosby sweater on. Um, I, I still have it, they're gonna come back, I promise you. Um, I, that's my grandmother. Um, I was a caregiver for my grandmother uh, when I was 16, who was dealing with Alzheimer's. And th it, that's where the, the, you know, the hook was set. That was the moment where I was like, there has gotta be a better way. Because the ripple effect of her Alzheimer's on me, on all of us, um, being a caregiver for the caregiver, my parents who were so consumed trying to work full time and help care for my grandmother, I saw firsthand what it did. And I've just always been asking, I was like, what can we do? There's got to be a, a better way to actually go deal with these challenges. And it's really funny. I just did the math. It was 20 years ago this month. Um, I was an intern hired out of graduate school. I'm a social scientist by training. I was hired to go work for Paul Allen's think tank about 10 minutes up the road here at 1801 Page Mill Road, right there in the shadow of Xerox Park. And they asked me to go study and do ethnographic field work where there was no computing. So I went and studied a nursing home. And believe me, there was no computing then 20 years ago, and there's not much now. Um, and and we, we studied this nursing home here in the Bay Area for about six months. And then we came back and we invented a bunch of prototypes of technologies that we thought would help the residents, that would help the staff, that would help the family. And these are pictures from a Fortune magazine article almost 20 years ago. There's me with a lot more hair. Um, I'm wearing sort of what was supposed to be sort of wireless earbuds because we observed the staff in nursing homes often lifting someone by themselves and then throwing their back out for the nurse because they couldn't figure out what doors, that long hallway of doors, the other staff were behind. So we wanted a hands-free headset that they could sort of call out and say, hey, can somebody come to room two and help me lift Mrs. Jones out of the bed? And we actually built our first remote patient monitoring technologies back there. We could monitor the heart rate. This thing kind of worked. This backpack of technology kind of worked for monitoring the heart rate. It would probably give you a heart attack if you were carrying it around. But it did kind of work. And we, we built this in a conference room, again, 10 minutes from here. And it was um, uh, this kind of nursing home of the future. And it was so real. We had the engineers who built the systems play the parts of people that we had actually studied at the nursing home. So we had engineers playing the parts of frail seniors. We had engineers playing the parts of the staff. And we had to then give this conference room back after this hour-long skit that we showed of what our nursing home of the future might be like. And so we're literally standing on the rubble of our ideas and somebody says, Eric, you asked the wrong question. Not how do you use technology to build a better nursing home, but how might you use technology to get rid of the notion of a nursing home? Now, I'm not anti-nursing home. I am not anti-hospital. There's a time and place for every part of the care continuum. The problem that we've got as we look at aging worldwide is that we're using the wrong tool for the job too often. We're using hospitals and nursing homes and inst institutional settings to deliver care in a real estate model of reactive health care that cannot scale to be dealing with successful aging and the global demographics that we face. So that's the theme that I kind of want to talk to you about here today. 
So we've been doing this at Intel for about 12 years, and Intel takes an ecosystem approach, which is what I love about the way that, that, the, that the HHS is approaching this. Right? They're saying, how can government and lots of different innovators and providers come together to build an ecosystem? Paul's trying to build an ecosystem in, in here in Silicon Valley of software, hardware, clinicians, social workers, and bringing that, that sort of, Todd called it, people mashup together and company mashup, organizational mashup, to go change things. And this is the way we do this. I mean, we've built, we've built PHR not-for-profits. You know, we've built research institutes around the world. We've built um, um, products and, and companies, right? We've built policy t uh, efforts. It takes all of those things, commercial, policy, government, uh, and all of those things brought together, marching in a direction to make something happen. And Intel, by no stretch, believes that we can do this alone. We believe in the Bill Joy rule, and we want to build an ecosystem of other people who are smarter about a lot of these things than us. So we did just spin out a new company about a year ago called Care Innovations. For those of you who are, are tackling the developer challenge today, one of the things I will tell you, and I judge a lot of developer challenges is, do your homework, right? Go find out what products are already out there, and don't just sort of replicate what's there, leap ahead of what's already out there, but do your homework, right? If, I, if I'm a judge and I'm sitting evaluating your idea, and I can do a Google search as you're demoing it to me and find 10 other things that are exactly like it, you've got a problem, right? So do your homework is one of the things I'll say to you. And I'm gonna, all through this talk, try to give you some really honest, open feedback based on our experiences as judges of these things, as an investors in these things, and as a company who's made a bunch of mistakes trying to make some of these successful aging technologies come to fruition. Don't go replicate our mistakes, make your own, right? And that's gonna be one of my messages to you today. So, you know, Paul showed some demographics this morning. One of the ones I just left in the deck um, was global demographics. And, and you had a question earlier about what about global? One of the major projects that my team's working on in right now is called Age-Friendly Cities in China. We are helping the Chinese government build out their health IT grid end to end for building an entire new multi-million person city next year that's ready for aging. And we're not going to build large, big box, expensive hospitals that are difficult to maintain. We're going to very, build a very small hospital, and we're going to use telehealth and mHealth and all of these capabilities and a broadband network that's designed to support collaborative care between a patient, two or three other people that can do high-definition video conferencing from the home. We are taking healthcare home and building it from the ground up to go do that. So it's important to realize we're in a global competition. The things that you're working on today for the United States here in our country are part of a global competition to figure out who's going to be able to design the next generation jobs and industries and capabilities. I think of this as gray technologies for global aging, just like we're used to the ideas of green technologies for global warming. But we're preparing as a nation to compete on the green technology front. Are we preparing as a nation to compete on the gray technology front? In 2050, you see that much of the world is purple. But it was, if you go back into the year 2000, much of Western Europe was already a third, a third of their population or even a fifth of their population over the age of 60. Because these countries are ahead of us on the age wave curve, they are out of necessity starting to innovate themselves out of their old healthcare paradigm. So we've got to remember that we're competing within a global context and that global aging is going to be a market opportunity. And I want the United States to build these capabilities for ourselves and then export these capabilities and sell them as new industries to the rest of the world. And, that, and it's really important to do our homework internationally as much as it is just within the US. About 10 years ago, I drew on a napkin at Intel. I still have the napkin. For the first time, I sat down with Andy Grove and, and, and Paulo Delini, our current CEO, and I said, look, conceptually, I want us to shift left or stay left. And this is the strategic framework we've been using for a very long time. If you think about on the bottom axis here, the cost of care per day conceptually, and on the, ver well, actually, let me go back. On the vertical axis, the quality of life, sometimes I also plant, plot expertise so low skilled expertise to sort of high skilled expertise here. We don't want to be in the intensive care unit. We don't want to be in the hospital if we don't have to be. You know, we want to be at home where the quality of life is high and where the cost is low. But we don't ask ourselves in terms of our quality metrics for care of people of all ages and seniors, was care delivered in the least restrictive, best setting possible for the patient? 
We assume that care just occurs in an institutional setting and we have to break that mindset. I guarantee you if we had quality metrics and all the RFPs that we were putting out that asked that question, was care delivered in the least restrictive, most safe setting for the patient, it would change where and how we do care. And the point is we have the technology to do that now. We've now got to have the reimbursement infrastructure and the care model definition that allows us to do that. But conceptually, how do you shift left or stay left? And a lot of this is how do you use information technologies to skill shift and place shift where care occurs when appropriate? Now, none of us are suggesting, I love the Kaiser Thrive commercial where they show the guy with a knife on the phone saying, where do I cut? You know, none of us are saying people are gonna do surgery on themselves, right? But there are gonna be a range of self-care technologies that we as patients are gonna to have to use and should be using uh, in, in the, in, as part of a collaborative care team that's gonna certainly have clinicians on it, that's gonna certainly have a primary care physician on it, but it may have new kinds of community care workers and others that we haven't even conceptualized. So as you do your design over the next two days, don't just think about the technology, as Todd said. What if we needed to invent a new role or a new kind of care provider to facilitate the use of that kind of technology? That's fair game. And in fact, if I go back to the European competitiveness question or the global competitiveness, we've been working in, with the European Union for the last five years on articulating four new kinds of categories of care workers that we don't even have language for in the United States right now. What's the curriculums, what are the credentials that they need, and what are the IT tools that they need to deliver? Right? And I, I, mean, I don't even know how to translate it to you. I, I mean, I can't even describe them to you because I don't even know what, the, what words to use because we're not thinking that way in the United States. So as you do your designs, it is about technology and care models and people. And if we need to invent new roles to skill, to shift left and skill, uh, uh, skill shift and, and play shift, then we should do that. Um, I'm going to change gears. I was going to actually, I'm going to pop out of the slides. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some things that we built way before iPads and Ultrabooks existed, way before Facebook existed. And in this case, I'm going to encourage you, steal these ideas and make them better. When we started this work more than a decade ago, there were no conferences on technology and aging. There was nobody focusing on this issue. So my team, as we started doing this research around the world and building these prototypes, were very open and public about the ideas that we were doing. We are trying to create, at a, at a sort of business level, the demand for computing for Intel. We were not in the apps business, so we never brought a lot of these things to market. But we tested them with a lot of people, and there was an incredible sense of value in some of the capabilities I'm about to show you. So any of this is sort of fair game for people to take and extend, and now we have platforms like Facebook and online communities and mobile devices that are around that we didn't have 10 years ago when we built some of these first ideas. So I'm going to share a couple of these with you, and they're going to echo themes that Paul talked about at the beginning about it's not just about health, but it's about quality of life. And the really first one I want to start with you, because in some ways it was the most powerful. And I will say in our research, it echoes the, the, the message that Paul gave about loneliness kills. Size and quality of social network for seniors is the most important variable in our studies for all 20 countries that we've studied. When we do our segmentations of seniors and try to figure out you know, what kinds of services we're going to intervene, it is their perception of their social network and the actual fact of what their social network configuration is that helps us predict their coming health in the future. So it basically goes, once their social network goes, so goes their health. Let's figure out how we can design tools that help them to maintain their social network. And this is one of the very full first tools that we built and tested. Long story short, in about a hundred household study of people with Alzheimer's that we studied, when we went back and actually talked to the families and when we actually talked to the sort of early stage people with dementia, they would often tell us things, that we would hear these stories time and time again that said, you know, mom would sort of have trouble on the phone and that was our first indicator that there might be something wrong cognitively. Or um, she became incredibly lonely and depressed. And in fact, we said, well, can we set out to measure changes in your social network for two reasons. One, to alert somebody that their social network is declining and figure out then how do we help prop up their social network. And two, could you actually diagnose or differentiate the onset of something like dementia based on the change? It's one of those sensors that we're going to talk about, or those signals, based on the change of their social patterns compared to their own norm. So that's what we sort of set out to do. So we did a couple of things. We took um, about 60 homes in Las Vegas and in Portland of people with early, uh, who are living alone with early uh, to moderate, uh, mostly early stage dementia. 
And we uh, censored the heck out of the homes because we didn't know what was going to sort of work and what wasn't. And this was all, we had sort of human subjects in place and privacy in place. And in fact, designing the interfaces to allow these seniors to decide who got the data was one of our biggest design challenges because you don't want them to have to be like a network administrator and they're going right click properties, George gets this, you know, so and so. It was a really complicated design challenge. So we put sensors in their home that did a couple of things. We could kind of guess how many people came to visit them based on these sensors. We could look at the amount of phone calls that came in and out of the house. We weren't recording everything they said, just the, the, who they talked to and for how long. And, and then if they used email, and some of them did back then, what, what they were doing. And we would munge all that together and collect their baseline of their social health based on those indicators for about four or five months. And then we put some interventions in place to see if we could actually help them improve or increase the quantity and quality of their social interaction. The first device we built was a little LCD screen. It was expensive 10 years ago, but now it would be cheap. Put it next to their landline phone, and it was just sort of caller ID on steroids. And it would show, this is Geraldine, she's your friend, and we had this little dialogue box that was a recording of what your last conversation was about with that person. We didn't think anybody would fill that out, everybody filled it out. Because you think about it, you're talking to your mom, she's starting to lose her memory, she forgets that you've already sorted out the fact you're gonna go to dinner tonight, you're at work, you're getting irritated because she's calling you at six or seven times. And our system is smart enough to sort of say, you've already called your son at work three times today, do you want me to go ahead and put the call through? And they could go back and look at their log and see, oh, we already had that conversation. It was incredibly empowering. And a lot of the people with early stage dementia felt like, oh, I can answer the phone now because this is just enough con context for me to cheat. Sometimes they still wouldn't remember who the person was, even though it's their daughter, but it would be enough for them to get into the conversation with them and feel like they could fake it, and then suddenly they could make it because they could fake it, right? Incredibly powerful tool for the people that we did this with. Steal this, improve it, make it an iPhone app, make it a smartphone app. You will change the lives of people with dementia. I don't have any doubt. We, did, we, just, we weren't setting out to do a business. We were setting out to understand the needs of people and whether they could do this when we actually did this. So here's another piece of it. We other intervention that we did was this more complex thing that we wanted to give people tools to be able to visualize. Now remember, these are people with memory loss, to visualize their social network. So it was this metaphor, we put the senior in the center. Most of these people did not have more than six to eight people in their social network. It was not hard. There was one woman in the study who still had a lot of friends, and we had to redesign the screen because she had like 100 icons floating around. It was like, you know, <laughs> space wars or something going on here. But most of them didn't have that many. They would roll over the faces of people that were familiar with them so they could practice sort of name, face, recognition flashcards before somebody was coming over. And based on the sensors, based on the software of what was going, this would sort of move in or further away. So the bad children were out here, they're not getting an inheritance, and the good children are here quite close in. Right? The, the, one woman did call this the inheritance detection system because she's like, <laughs> At which we laugh, but this actually gets at the privacy issues, right? To some people, this data is incredibly private. To other people, they're like, I don't care if this is on the internet. And to other people, they're like, I won't mind my daughter seeing this, but I don't want my son-in-law to see it. Privacy is in the eye of the beholder, and you have to build a privacy policy and a technical infrastructure that allows them to make choices on who gets access to the data. And we learn this right away, even with something as innocuous as, what's my social pattern? What's going on here? So that's an example for me of, and then over time, there were other people that couldn't read that. It was too complex, so we would just give them a graph of what would their social index over a period of time. That was even too complex for some of the people. You would just give them a summary that says you were a little less socially active yesterday than you were last week and a lot more than you were six months ago. Right? So even the ability of different people to sort of understand data, interpret it, you've got to have multiple lenses on that. Some people can understand that sort of flying, screaming headline chart. Some people can understand graphs. Some people just need a textual reminder. But this was incredibly powerful, like particularly for the women in the studies. They would put sticky notes all around their house saying, I forgot to go out to dinner with my very best friend. And, uh, and they're way out here on the curve. And they, over the course of the next week or so, they could start to see, because of their actions, their social network, people were coming in closer to them on the screen. It made them feel better. The last intervention that we did, we called the presence lamp. I don't have a demo of it here. All, here's all we did. We took the family caregiver, the chief family caregiver, usually, usually the adult daughter, and the person with dementia, and we used our same infrastructure that we had in their homes to turn on a lamp in, her, in mom's house 
uh, when I'm home as her caregiver and vice versa. So when my mom's either at home or sitting in her favorite chair, a lamp turns on in my house. Just the lamp coming on, now the adult children were like, oh my God, if my mom knows every time that I'm home, she's gonna call me nonstop and I'm gonna kill her, right? That's not what happened. The, both parties were like, wow, just having the lamp on made me feel safe because I knew I could reach out to them if I needed to. By the way, we then took that same technology and we took people who were in a support group for people with Alzheimer's, with advanced Alzheimer's, these are burnt out caregivers, and we, we put the presence lamp in their homes and what that would allow is, if I'm you know, and up in the middle of the night taking care of my loved one with sundowners who won't go to sleep at three in the morning, you feel like you're the only person on the planet that's alive and awake, and you feel so isolated and alone. Their lamp would turn on, and it was one of the people in their support group was also up, and they could go to his little screen, figure out who it was, and if it was 3.30 in the morning, they could have a call with one another, right? Simple, simple technologies doing amazing things those are the kinds of goals that I think you ought to be setting for yourself. And then so how do you scale these in terms of business models as we go forward? I'm gonna show you a couple of other um, examples around um, Gate and Falls. So we were funding a bunch of challenges and a bunch of university grants in the area of Falls. And one of the challenges is nobody was ever getting to outcome studies to prove that their widget actually did something to help either prevent falls or sort of show that there was a risk for falls. So one of the things that we did was we said, look, everybody in our programs now that we're gonna fund has to do this in an open source way. So we created a, a software environment called Biomobius. You can go online, go Google Biomobius, and you'll see this whole sort of software infrastructure where all these bioengineers and clinicians have now started building tools that everybody else in the ecosystem can use on top of that. Um, so so stop, the, stop the not invented here problem, stop the lack of sharing um, algorithms, and, and have everybody sort of build on a base software platform. We also did the same thing for hardware. I was bankrupting my budgets at Intel as I was sneaking technology from our labs to all these uh, startups and universities. And we finally just said, we gotta stop. And we actually built this little tiny device called Shimmer. I didn't bring it today. Uh, I think it's, it might, might be in my bag there. A little, little microcomputer, plug and play, Legos, that same little microcomputer, matchbox size. It's now sold by a company called Shimmer-Research.com, uh, real time incorporated in Ireland. So Intel didn't want to be in that business, but we helped somebody else in the ecosystem who did. Um, it's basically like that little matchbox computer you can plug and play and it can become a three lead ECG for monitoring stress. It can become an accelerometer for actually looking at changes in gait. And the point was, we didn't want all of our recipients going out and building their own hardware. They only, we only wanted them to build new hardware if there was no existing hardware that solved their problem, right? This allowed us to get to outcome studies and to do some pretty amazing things with gait and falls. We believe, and this is a grand challenge for you, that three quarters of falls that cost about $45 billion in the United States each year from falls and fall-related injuries could be gotten rid of, three quarters of them, if you could figure out some pattern changes that show that someone was becoming at a risk for falls. In the 300 household cohort of seniors that we have in Portland and the 300 household cohort of seniors that we have in Ireland, where we've censored the heck out of them, what it comes down to is this. This is one of the approaches. We built sort of this magic carpet that allowed us to look at your stride length, your heel to toe strike, the velocity with which you walk down the hall in the morning, capture your baseline, so how you walk down the hall every morning is rather patterned and rather similar. Changes from your own baseline are telling us something's wrong. And now we can do the same thing with accelerometry. And increasingly, as the accelerometry is built into our cell phones and other devices, we don't even have to use anything new. It's just the stuff that's already with us. And what we found out was that there's kind of um, two reasons why most of these people are falling. Muscle mass and meds mix. I call it the M's. It's the, the epidemic of the M's. It's not because they have some deep neurological problem. There's a very, very small percentage of people. It's that because we're not coordinating their care amongst their doctors, we're over or under medicating them and, and putting them on the same prescription two or three different times because nobody's sort of tracking the meds list. In those 600 households, we can look at our data and say, oh my gosh, somebody's gone off to see a specialist today and their meds mix has changed because we can see the deviations in their movement patterns around the house compared to their own norm. So we call the care team and say, can somebody check and make sure that we didn't over or under decrease or increase their blood pressure? And more often than not, that's the problem. Or it's a, meds, it's a, it's a muscle mass problem. 
these older people are not getting their 10,000 steps a week for, all, for a day for all of the um, uh, challenges that, of loneliness and, and getting out and, and other kinds of things. So we use the same technology to sort of close the loop and everything from kind of dance dance revolution from seniors that are just wearing the same little shimmer device and it now walks them through a series of stepping exercises. And we did some fun things in nursing homes where it was like we would do a challenge for the whole hallway because the individuals didn't want to track their steps and sort of compete. We'd say as a hallway, if you guys all achieve 150,000 steps this week, and there was a little TV at the end with a monitor that was showing their progress towards goal. And of course, very quickly, a lot of these seniors are knocking on their doors going, we're not going to hit our 150,000 steps. And they go make each other walk and so forth, right? <laughs> Game changing, simple technology situated into social contexts that allow other people to act with other people to go solve problems that are health problems, but are quality of life problems as well. Magic kinds of things that we can go do. Um, I'll share with you, actually let me go over here, I haven't actually looked at this in a while. So one of the holy grails, and I think you'll talk about this in terms of the signal, signal work that you're going to do today is, how can you meaningfully monitor activities of daily living? Uh, because we, again, we think if you could look at people's activities of daily living and the changes from their own patterns, it becomes a new vital sign, if you will. And the challenge of this is, you know, there's only so far that you can go with algorithms and sensor networks, uh, like a, most of the sensor networks that we had tested to this point were kind of X10 sensors like you would have in your home security system. It doesn't really know if it's me or Todd in the room. It's just sort of looking at firings of a sensor going on and off. So we asked ourselves, if you increase the sensor density, would the algorithms that are trying to look at the okayness of someone based on changes of their activities of daily living get better? So we actually built this device that is a, a wrist-worn RFID reader, and we built these little tiny tags that are basically shake tags with a radio and put them on key objects in the house. And, but, and what we did, and I'll give you an example from what we sort of did with the Veterans Administration. So now imagine the key objects in the house or in the apartment are labeled. Actually, let me go back. Um, so like the kettle or the tea bag or whatever, and I know that it's been moved if somebody actually moves it. I don't, still don't know it was you necessarily, but I can surmise that because you're wearing a wrist-worn wrist RFID tag, and it's like, well, I'm assuming you're the one that's wearing it, right? We don't really know. Somebody could have swapped it out. But what this did was pretty magical. Suddenly, the accuracy of the algorithms looking at, you know, was this person able to do their activities of daily living on their own? And this was inspired by a woman in our study. I'll never forget it. I was in Rochester, New York. I have to tell this story real quick. I was in Rochester, New York. I go, it was the opening day. There were six families I was going to live with for a couple of weeks, and this was the first day, so I was going to go meet all of the families. It was snowing like crazy. I'd run my rental car into their mailbox. It was totally embarrassing. <laughs> And I'm discombobulated, and I come to the door, and it's a fairly young couple that answered the door. I mean, they were, they were in their you know, uh, early 50s, and most of the people in our Alzheimer's study were much older than that. And so I come in, I sit down on their couch, and I'm, I'm so confused because I've hit their mailbox that I can't remember which of the couple has been diagnosed with dementia. And it was <laughs> not obvious when we were sitting there talking to them. So the woman's name was Barbara, her husband's name was Phil, they're like, would you like some coffee? And finally, after we've been talking for 10 minutes, Barbara goes in the kitchen, and like 30 minutes later, she hasn't come back. And finally, her husband's like, oh, we better go check in on Barbara. And then at that moment, I knew. It's like, oh, it must be Barbara. And we, it's still upsetting to me. We, walk, um, we walked in the kitchen, and Barbara's just, tears are pouring down her eyes, and she's staring at the cabinet. And she's got the coffee cup out, but she can't remember the next steps for how to make coffee. Right? And she's so embarrassed and she's so appalled. And we saw hundreds of homes who, who just struggled to sort of do this basic activity of daily living. So our holy grail was to build a system for somebody like Barbara that would be smart enough to not intervene until it knew that she was struggling with that task. And then could we somehow educate her and help her know what the right steps were at the right time to continue doing that activity of daily living for herself. And then again, at the same time, could the changes in that pattern tell us something medically meaningful about the onset or the characterization of her disease? 
So that, this is a grand challenge for you. We could not make this work, right? I mean, this was, we were doing this 10 years ago, and I think it would still be hard today. But what can we do to begin to do that? Yes, we can track activities of daily living, and yes, we can look at deltas that are very informative that say, your mom's not going to the kitchen, and she's a coffee drinker, and she hasn't been to her kitchen for the last three days. Somebody better check in on her. We're doing that now. There's products on the market that are doing that now. But closing the loop for somebody like Barbara that could say, okay, now you're still trying to do this task for yourself. How do we interrupt her? How do we walk her through? How do we develop tools that allow the family to do sort of mad libs where they can show video of her doing it in her kitchen? And how do you have algorithms that are smart enough to not intervene and replace her intelligence until she actually needs it? Those are hard computer science problems. Those are hard innovation problems. I would love for you to help take not just the raw sensing, but what we can do with that sensing to the next level and actually help the person maintain their quality of life and their sense of purpose and independence in their home. All right, where am I on time? How long do I have, Paul? 20 minutes, all right, I have to choose which ones I wanna show you because I, I do wanna pop back over and show you some of the tools that we use for, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's, we would be remiss to do a conference like this talking about successful aging and not talk about medications. All right, I'm gonna sum up a couple of years of research on meds in, in about two minutes. Long story short, we went and studied people who were trying to take nine to 10 more, seniors trying to take nine or 10 more, or more medications a day. Um, I'm an advanced kidney sufferer, I'm about to have a transplant myself and I'm taking 12 meds a day and I can't do it. And I don't have early stage dementia and other kinds of challenges that would go on with that. We basically violate with all of the tools that are in the market or most of the tools in the market, two fundamental premises of human behavior with the way that we approach med prompting today. One is we centralize their medications in one place. When we actually go study seniors and what they do and what they want to do, even those who are in a nursing home who are handed a blister pack from a nurse with all their meds centralized, they rip open the blister pack if they're allowed and they place the meds spatially around their home or around their lives because we don't just use time to remind ourselves to take meds, we use context and space is part of that context. So all of our systems today that are time-based reminders aren't really doing it. And we see seniors summarily turn them off. First of all, if it's an alarm going off at three o'clock and you took your med at 2.55, you get pissed off when the alarm goes off at three o'clock because it's so dumb, it doesn't know that you took it. So then you unplug the system and stop using it. Second of all, if you've got a big meds caddy sitting on your lovely sofa table that you spent three weeks trying to find, find the perfect decor to fit into your home and this ugly piece of technology is there screaming at you saying, I'm old, I'm frail, I need help, people take it off, turn it off and plug it away somewhere else in the house. So we're violating that sort of desire for people to get help but not necessarily broadcast to everybody that they want help. So here's what we did, and we tested this, and we have papers published that you can go search on this and, and find out what we did. Um, but the gist of it was this. We couldn't get our RFID track pill bottles 10 years ago to work. I think you could sort of do this now. So if you wanted people to be able to distribute their meds in place but still know that they took them, I think you could probably get closer to doing this today. So we still did the necessary evil of centralizing all the meds, but we built this pillbox, and Intel didn't want to be in the pillbox business, but we couldn't find one that existed, so we built it. And it had days of the week, and the day would light, and it had a little screen, and at least it could sort of say, hey, it's the purple pill you should be taking right now, or don't forget to take water with it. I don't know why no pillbox manufacturers have done this yet. They ought to do this, right? I mean, we haven't seen them do this, but it was like, that was incredibly powerful. And the pillbox knew if it had been touched and anybody had interacted with it or not. Is it perfect? Do I know that it was my mom? No, but I know that nobody's touched the pillbox in two days. Something's going on, right? And if that's a data stream that's coming in that's correlating with vital signs that are way off kilter, it's like, yeah, no one's touched the pillbox. No, it's no wonder she's having water retention over the last two days. She's not taking her the right, right medications. But then we prompted on a range of devices. And this is the magic of all the consumer electronics, the stuff that's around us is, we can start to customize the care plan, the prompting plan for the individual, for their personality, for the, comp for the technologies that they're comfortable with. So in our study, we could prompt on the television, we, could, we borrowed from Microsoft their spot watch, which they were developing at the time, so we could actually prompt on their watch. 
we could prompt on their phone, we could prompt on their cell phone, and we built this little audio beacon. It's not shown on the screen, but it was about this big, and it was sort of voice tones that could prompt them, and they could put this little audio beacon in every room of their house. And people configured these things completely differently. No two homes were the same, right? I mean, we had every combination of those things. There were people in our studies that were like, prompt me in the middle of TV and it will make me do it. And then pause it and don't let the TV go again until I go take my meds, right? That's like 20% of the people. The other 80% is like, you mess up my Oprah, you are dead, right? And I will turn this thing off, right? But they liked the audio prompting. A lot of the women in the study liked the phone-based system because our system would be smart enough to, first of all, not bug you while you were asleep unless it was a critical medication. Because, and we had a sensor in the bed from the other study, so we knew whether or not you were asleep and restless and so forth. It was like we'd wait until right when you got up and you'd just come out of the bathroom and say, this is a good time to prompt them. And then the other thing that we did was we didn't bug you if you were on the phone. We waited until you got off the phone and then had the phone ring back and it would be like, and, and these women, I, we, we have video of the study, they would be like, oh, hi, Gladys, how are you? And they're just faking a phone call with somebody, and it's our system calling and whispering to them that it's time to take their meds. But this is an important finding. Helping people without necessarily broadcasting to the world and embarrassing them that they need help is an important design principle. Stealth help can be a good thing. The other thing that we did is we put a tiny LCD screen next to the, room that, or next to the door that they would most often leave the house on or the apartment in. And that little screen, we, we had the, it was the fixing to get ready to go algorithm or it the, looks like you just got home algorithm based on the sensor network. When you came home, our system would say, it looks like you've been out for four hours. Did you take your meds while you're out? And if not, you take them now. And if it looks like you're getting ready to leave because our algorithm's sort of guessing that you are, it would say, looks like you're getting ready to leave. Don't forget to take your medications with you or take them now if it's appropriate. We increased compliance significantly. We didn't want to productize any of this. We just wanted to understand the basic learnings about meds prompting. Steal these ideas, make them better, bigger, use the technologies that are now much more widely available than we did this, and, and, and help seniors self-medicate and reduce the number of medications that they're taking and the errors that's going off between them. All right, so there's a few examples of lessons learned. I could do many more, but I won't um, from our studies. I want to shift gears slightly as I sort of close here to just give you some other coaching and advice, take it or leave it, based on some of our learnings. The first of them is this. Not all seniors are the same. It's a useless word, senior. It's a useless word, older people, right? This is one of four different segmentations of seniors that we use. And knowing who you're designing for is a really critical first step. Right? We have in this particular, this is sort of our functional one, right? We've got those who will willingly commit, we've got the Hale and Hardy, we've got the sort of steady staters, a few chronic disease, but my quality of life is basically fine. I've got some serious problems, but I'm stoically coping with it. These are sort of people with a lot of frailty, and, and these are frequent flyers, and these are downward dependents, right? Your design from a business model, from a technology model, might be very different. Or you may try to choose two or three of these segments and say, which of my solutions going for? But the lifestyle of somebody who willingly commit versus functionally frail is radically different. So just using the word seniors is not helpful, right? Using people 65 and above is not helpful. We, and age is not even all that helpful. We see people in our studies who are 85 and 90 who are better off than people who are 65. So you can't even sort of use age. You've got to figure out who your market is and who you're targeting these things for and don't treat everybody as the same. The second is, and, and, and this point was made earlier um, by, by uh, Paul, this is, you know, health is more than just the absence of disease or injury. Independence is more than just sort of assistance. You want to be designing for the whole experience of older people. This is an opportunity map, what we call our opportunity maps. This is generated from years of that kind of ethnographic field work. And we come back from that field work and we do these harvest sessions with all these ideas. All these sticky notes were then turned into this opportunity map. This is the opportunity map we're using at Intel over time to figure out how do we develop applications and services for seniors. Part of it is bringing healthcare home. That's been a big focus for us. How do they not have to travel for healthcare? So we spun off a company focused on telehealth and independent living. How do they have help getting care? How do they ha enable social interaction? You saw the, so the first tool that we ever built was focused on social interaction. This is one of the biggest for us. How do they have a meaningful and useful life? We've got online tools where we're taking online training tools that are used in education and helping seniors sign up to teach classes virtually uh, you know, two hours a week. 
we've done some of the social networking in, in, in nursing homes where it's like, you know, the Facebook type functionality allows them to discover other people that were in their same World War II unit living on the other building at the other end of their campus, but they may as well live in different planets, right? So how do you sort of create a, a sense of meaningful and useful life? You saw it in the video that Paul showed, right? Use the gardening skills that the woman has and help her figure out mechanisms for giving that back. How do they choose the environments of choice that they want? How do they feel safe? How do we support their cognition? And how do we support physical activities? Right? Narrowing in the value vector that your ideas are, uh, are focused on is really important. And, and, and not just thinking about health care, but thinking about the quality of life of older people, what are the interventions you could do, I think will get us really far in that regard. And, it, and it's not so much a matter of following our opportunity map, though there's a lot of data behind this, it's really like what's the opportunity map that you're gonna do? And then piece it out, right? It's like, okay, focus in on this wedge of the pie, move to the next wedge of the pie, move to the next wedge. Otherwise, it's sort of random innovation. I'm gonna totally into people mashups, the phrase that Paul used, uh, or, uh, or that um, Todd used earlier. We have a framework at Intel that we call, affectionately refer to as the butt model. Um, you could call it the tub model, but it's not as sort of you know, irritating for people, so I call it the butt model. The business usage and technology model. We live and breathe by this. Our teams are set up there. My China team, my Europe team, my US team who do healthcare pathfinding, on everything we're doing from genomics to seniors, we use the butt model approach. We hire people who can come in and help understand the business model, the technology model, and the usage model. And what's important is your ideas need to cover all of these disciplines and perspectives in order to become viable. It is totally fine if you start with the technology, believe me, this is Intel, we start with the technology a lot, right? And say, what else can you do with it? But eventually, you have to cover all three of the circles and figure out the usage model. Is it useful to people? Is it usable to people in a sustainable way? Just because it's useful or usable and they can download the app and use it once, is it sustainable? Big difference, right? Everyone loves to come to, everyone knows I kind of critique mHealth a lot because there's a lot of vaporware out there, right? People will be like, Eric, there's 65,000 apps you know, that you can download for diabetes. And I'm like, well, that's 59,595 too many. And how many of them are downloaded more than once and used in a sustained way? So you can't just design it to be usable, it's got to be useful in a sustained way. And then from a business perspective, is there a market, is there a financial way in which these things can be brought forth? You have to cover all those circles eventually. And it means for us, a healthcare butt model, looking at it from a sort of provider payer perspective is, you know, the human viewpoint. Can it be integrated into workflow? Is there training in place? You know, is there a staff retention? I shouldn't say J Health, it should just say Health. Is it usable and useful? Is it desirable, right? All of those are sort of characteristics of the usage. From a business viewpoint, is there a payment model? Is there governance and liability? How's profitability gonna occur? How's the ecosystem gonna change by this intervention coming into it? Who's gonna resist it because you're actually taking away some of their money? If you don't think about all those kinds of things, it's hard to be successful. And then certainly from a technology viewpoint, does the organization have an IT strategy and plan and how does my new intervention fit with or disrupt their current plans for what they're doing with their IT? Can they do care coordination? Is it community based? Is it cost effective? These are the kinds of questions that you have to start thinking about. And we, when we build our incubation, we require every person who comes in and presents, the very first time they ever come and pitch the concept, to tell the business, the usage, and the technology story even if they don't know it for sure. And then they tell us what their degree of risk is. You know, I kind of made up the usage story. I don't really know if it's believable. And then we ask ourselves as funders, well, what would it take for all of us to have the next level of confidence that we actually believe their usage model? Well, we want some focus groups done and we want to actually go talk to CIOs. Okay, we do that. Okay, that usage story has moved together. The, tech, or the business story, right? What do we have to believe that uh, the business? So we're incubating all three aspects at fits and starts, but we're not gonna make major funding decisions to move the whole thing forward until they all are sort of roughly equal with one another, right? And you're, you're d decreasing your risk as you go forward. I do three hour talks on just the butt model, so that's kind of sort of cutting it short. So let me close here and say, look, at the end of the day, it's about people, not processors. I love this. Can you believe we got married, raised a family, and retired, oh, without the help of a handheld computer? Right? I am not here from Intel to say, you know, technology to the rescue. Far from it, right? But, but it also 
has to be a lever that we're going to use to achieve health care reform. You don't double the number of people and then double them again in a 50-year period who are over the age of 60 on the planet and think that health care as usual is going to work, think care as usual is going to work. Right? In 1950, there were 3,000 people who were over the age of 100. In 2050, there will be 8 million. That's over the age of 100 on the planet. Think of the number of 80, 80 90, 70, and 60-year-olds if that's the case. So we're going to have to use technology as part of the solution. I won't go over the global challenges thing. My own audacious challenge, what we've been trying to drive is, what if we had a 2020 vision that said we were going to move 50% of care that's done in institutions today to the home within 10 years? What kinds of apps, what kind of interventions can we do that would place shift and skill shift care? And we ought to focus it on seniors as an initial starting place for that. Finally, I'll end with Paul's sort of theme as well in terms of go, to go to the, my advice in terms of going to the moon. We've got to get collaborative, get real, get large, get political, and get moving. Get collaborative is build on the work of others internationally and don't sort of be, I mean, it's, it's good to sort of have isolated innovation, but then you've got to pop up and sort of look around and see what's already there and see what else that you can build on top of. Um, get real, a lot of folks come to me and say, oh, we're going to build a smart home lab for seniors. I'm like, please don't. The last thing in the world we need is a bunch of undergraduates in a university pretending to be frail seniors. Build real technologies and test them with real families, real clinicians, and real seniors. Please don't spend the money on stupid smart home labs that don't do a darn thing for us. Third, get large. It's great that you can test something out with 10 people. You gotta start with that, but at some point we're gonna have to do larger trials of some of these things, especially if they're clinical interventions. We're trying to push nationally right now for a 10,000 household cohort of broadband connected seniors as a platform that all industry players can use and all universities can use to test out some of these things. Because recruiting and setting all this up is difficult to even sort of test out your, your concept or your application going forward. That's called the Silver Initiative. Get political. Um, you know, we've got to change our thinking as we're looking at health IT investments. I love the, the, what we're doing in terms of data liberation. The, the Affordable Care Act is setting us down a path where suddenly we're starting to think very differently about payment, and that means a lot of intervention, in, innovation around prevention and early detection is suddenly going to be legitimate because of the payment model that we're looking at. But we can't continue to be clinic dominated by our thinking about this. We need to consciously be looking at how do we place shift and skill shift care to the home. China passed a 10-year plan to move 60% of care in institutions to the home. So we, I said 50, they're going for 60. The European Union created a plan for increasing the quality and longevity of every citizen in Europe within 10 years by two years. And then they set technology policy, workforce policy, uh, reimbursement policies to start to achieve that. We need something like that to sort of aim for. And then finally, get moving. Um, I showed you those charts that showed the whole world is dealing with global aging. Even the youngest countries are going to be dealing with it because of the economic impact on the entire world. So this is an opportunity to invent these great technologies and scale them to the rest of the world while basically helping the quality of life of our own parents. That's my goal. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, fortunately, I reached my goal of having two great speakers for you to listen to. Um, we do have about five more minutes if you want to ask, make some comments or ask questions of Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, now I'm really self-conscious. Yeah. That was great. Um, the question I have is, what kind of innovations are you seeing in this um, space between clinicians and providers in shared decision making? <laughs> We're doing a bunch of work on, the U.S. doesn't really understand or focus much on time banking, but if you look at the volunteer movements in other countries, like in, in a lot of the European countries, there's this whole time banking software infrastructure that's been built up. It is Paul's video of exchange of services. So we've been doing some experiments where you, you take sort of education software, time banking software, and sort of clinical practice software and start to merge those things. And you sort of create this kind of team-based portal model um, and, and, and you then actually sort of say, look, I need somebody to help sort of do this particular role in the life of a senior, and you have this whole way in which they can sort of sign up for it, they can then, you know, get credit for it, um, they can have little competitions to see who donated the most, or they can say, they can either donate it or they can actually exchange it and say, I'll do somebody's yard if they'll drive me or whatever. It, it is his video, right? And I think 
the merger of sort of care coordination tools that we're going to have to have for team-based care and an ACO and sort of volunteer tracking and then sort of online education tools, those kind I don't know which sector of the software ecosystem will sort of win. I just know that we need all of those capabilities coming in for a new kind of way of doing care coordination. Our, our premise has been a, a um, primary care driven care team, but then we sort of extrapolate that out and we're like, okay, it's gonna have you know, a neighbor and a family member, and then, then you have to sort of step back and sort of say, how do we educate all of those players to do the role? How do we know that they did the role that they were do? And from a training perspective and a quality tracking perspective, don't just track the skill of the clinician to deliver it, track the skill of the neighbor. Some neighbors are gonna be well trained and are gonna do a good job at this and you wanna reward it. Others are gonna stink and it's like, okay, well, I don't want them doing that anymore. So our quality tracking tools are gonna to have to include that extended care team, not just the clinical people. Um, I'm fascinated that your experience and kind of passion for this started as a 16 year old. <laughs> and um, I'm wondering if you could speak to reaching young people and inspiring them to be interested in working in this field and making a difference in, in the systems that you're all talking about. And, and how do you not just reach them, but help them thinking um, get them to go into what you're doing as opposed to creating some lab where they're college students and they don't really understand like the implications of the big picture. Well, I mean, one, of the, one of the ways that we enlist people is field work never fails at disappointing points. So we take the engineers of all ages and the people with us into the field because then they see firsthand that there's a guy who doesn't want to buy a shirt and can't remember the steps and they start going, oh, there's technical ways that we can do that. So there's magic I think we're increasingly living in parts of the world where we don't have sort of, our, our, our grandparents are not necessarily part of our lives because of distance and, and sort of other reasons. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I do find that today's generation, I'm struggling to get them interested in these issues of aging. There's a, 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 a I'll just say a well-known Silicon Valley company who does really successful things with search, who shall remain nameless, who when, when I go and sort of talk to them, and it's primarily a very young population, it's like they haven't had a chronic disease yet, so they're not experiencing themselves, and they haven't had the experience of having older people in part of their lives. And it's not that they don't care, they just haven't been exposed to it. So we're gonna have to come up with some creative of ways of exposing people to the lived experience of the majority of the people on the planet. I mean, it's like, come on, folks. We're going to have 7 billion people, and 2 billion of them are going to be over the age of 65. They're, the, they're going to be the majority. So we've got to get older culture to be something that's not stigmatized and that we can talk about. Last question over here, please. On your uh, pill bottle, the technical pill bottle, yep. you didn't say how, how you make sure that it gets refilled how the pills get in there. Did you work on any technology related to that part of the medical compliance part of it? Uh, and the part where you have to find out, oh, is your, is your cholesterol destroying your kidney? Um, did you work on that part of it also, where the doctor won't give you the pills till you've taken the the kidney test and things like that, that, that part of the social area. Well, I'm, I'm living that one right now, personally, I can tell you, um, as, I, as I go through my 44 tests to get approved for the transplant. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, just to, from a personal story, getting, getting the care that's been provisioned to me in all the places that I've lived in the country to help get me ready for a transplant is, is like an act of Congress in and of itself. So that, that's a challenge. Um, our solution to the pill filling was not technical. Uh, it, the, our, our approach was to use smart humans better to do the filling. Today, a home care nurse is sent out based on a schedule to refill these caddies, not based on whether it actually needs to be filled or not, right? So we, our sensing technology could show 
that for whatever reason, you don't know why, they took four or five pills out of it when they were only supposed to take one, or they haven't taken any of their meds. It's like, don't go refill the caddy until the caddy needs to be refilled. Don't just do it on time-based. And I think that's a lot of the promise of the telehealth stuff that we've been doing. Today, we're using nurses and, and nurse practitioners on a time-based model that says, it's January 15th, this is when I'm scheduled to call in to check in the okayness of this patient. Our technologies, whether it's vital signs capture, or activities of daily living capture, let you triage so that you deal with the patients that most need to be seen that day in a more automatic way. I think that's the principle that we, these technologies can help us for. It's not about replacing the humans, but optimizing their time um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better way and helping them do triage. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'd like to give uh, Erica a round of applause for a wonderful <laughs>